word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up the mountain to pray. While he was praying, his face changed in appearance, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were conversing with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of the exodus that he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions had been overcome by sleep, but becoming fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As they were about to part from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he did not know what he was saying. While he was still speaking, a cloud came and cast a shadow over them and they became frightened when they entered the cloud. From Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my chosen son. Listen to him. After the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. They fell silent and did not at that time tell anyone what they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. First of all, I'm Monsignor Campion from our Sunday Visitor, and I'm delighted to be here this weekend and a few more weekends. Uh, you folks at uh, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, there seems to be an epidemic of fractures among the clergy. <laughs> About the only time I get to see you is when somebody breaks an ankle or a leg or something. And, but anyway, uh, uh, I'm glad to be here. Every uh, November, uh, when the Feast of Christ the King comes around, I, I know that I'm going to have to allow myself about 10 more extra minutes in getting ready for Mass because I'll have to look through the Roman Missal, the book that we, the priest, the celebrant uses at Mass, to find the Feast of Christ the King. It appears in uh, no... Uh, order at least that I've been able to determine. It's not in the index and uh, I get very disgusted being an editor uh, about uh, the fact that it's not in the index and it's sort of lost somehow among all the other feasts. And in disgust I say that um, the next time I'm in Rome I'm going to the congregation for worship and track down those guys who put the index together. Uh, well, I've never done that and uh, probably never will. But I think if I ever went to that office in Rome, which is responsible for uh, these uh, books and so forth, I wouldn't complain, uh, but I would compliment. Uh, and I think the point that I would make in compliment, I maybe first of all, would be the choice of readings that uh, the church has made for the masses of Lent. Magnificent selections. Uh, really extraordinarily helpful for us as we move through this season. Uh, some of the readings can be uh, quite frank, uh, warning us through the words of the gospel that uh, turning away from God, which is sin, uh, does not work to our benefit. And others are instructive. Uh, last week, the reading had something to do with fasting. 
But through them all, through all the readings, there is the element of encouragement, and there is the element of invitation. Come to the Lord. And that is the case in this morning's passage from the Gospel of Luke that we just heard. A very familiar incident in the life of Jesus, recorded also in Matthew and Mark. Uh, we call it the transfiguration. That's not a gospel term, but that's the word that we have developed, that Christians have developed over the centuries to describe this particular event. You remember the story from a few moments ago. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the summit of a high mountain. By the way, we don't know what that mountain is, uh, traditionally, it's uh, thought to be Mount Tabor in Galilee, not too far from Nazareth, but the gospel never tells us which mountain it was. But in any case, Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the summit of a high mountain. And there everything suddenly changed. He um, says his clothing became dazzlingly white um, and brilliance and majesty surrounded him and then at his side appeared Elijah and Moses most beloved prophets of the Hebrew tradition and it was magnificent well the story is about Jesus, as is every gospel about Jesus, and so it is marvelous to hear this story, but Jesus is not the only one in the story, and there are three others, you know. And I think the church is telling us the story not only to reveal to us who Jesus is, but also to say something to us about our effort to be closer to the Lord by giving us the example of Peter, James, and John. They're great saints. I wonder how many Catholic churches in the world are named St. Peter or St. James or St. John. Hundreds, I guess, maybe thousands. So um, we look upon them with the greatest of reverence. But this reading today from Luke reminds us that Peter and James and John were not somehow super people. They were human beings. The gospel says they uh, went to sleep. They were tired. Angels don't get tired. Human beings do. Uh, and then as the story unfolds, they can't put it all together. And the story occurs against the backdrop of the fact that they probably didn't fully understand who Jesus was. And then they experience this magnificent vision. And how did they react? They were afraid. Pretty human, weren't they? So here we are in Lent, we humans. 
Um, we were attempting to know who Jesus is. We um, are attempting to follow him. That's what you were saying to me this morning, I'm saying to you in this church. It's the reason we're here. But we're making a statement to each other. We're trying to follow Jesus. And let us something of an intense moment in that process, focused moment. But we are, um, we're just like Peter, James, and John. They were not in the least different from us, and we're not different from them. We're human beings. Now let's go a little bit farther in the reading. So here they were, fatigued. Here they were, not getting the message. Here they were, frightened. And so that's the end of the story. No, it's not the end of the story, and that's what the church wants us to know today. The church wants us, yes, to know that they were human beings. That's an important part of the story. Yes, the church wants us to know that they were weary and that they were puzzled and that they were afraid. But that's not the end of the story. What is the end of the story? The end of the story is that Jesus revealed himself to them. He let them know who he was. And then even when that overpowered them and they were afraid, God himself spoke to them. See, the message is, I think for us, that if we really take Lent seriously, if we really take Lent seriously and try to use Lent as the opportunity to draw more closely to the Lord, we don't have to swim upstream. Because the Lord will be there to help us. That's what happened with Peter, James, and John, these ordinary human beings. The Lord was there to help them. And the Lord will be there to help us. No matter how human we are, or no matter how evil we are, the Lord never gives up on us. Several months ago, one of the TV channels uh, aired a documentary about the Nuremberg trials. Now, I'm not old enough to remember that event, those events, and probably not few in this room remember them. But what the Nuremberg trials were, they were courtroom proceedings in Nuremberg, Germany in 46, I guess, 1946, when the victorious allies actually tried in the judicial sense the leadership of Germany that had governed before and during the Second World War. The trial heard testimony, and it was 
nauseating to hear how systematically decent human beings had been tortured and slaughtered by the millions, literally. Horrifying story to hear. Well, I forget the number, but something like 20 or 25 of the top leadership of the German government in the 30s and 40s were convicted and sentenced to be hanged. So the day came for the sentences to be carried out. Um, and about a dozen or so had Catholic roots. And so they would be led to the scaffold to be hanged. And a priest would be walking beside them. And he'd walk up the steps beside them. And he would stand beside them as the noose was placed around the necks. And he was there when the trap door was opened. And somebody watched that documentary and said to me the next day, Father, that was absolutely repulsive for me to think that any priest would be there with one of those characters. And I said, well, I want to tell you something, that's our business. Because uh, like the church, we never, ever give up. Those priests in those situations, they didn't give up as they were walking across that prison yard to the scaffold. They didn't give up when they walked up the steps with those people, those defendants. They didn't give up there when the noose was placed around the neck. Um, it always did not work. But the reason the church never gives up, the reason the Lord never gave up, one of the most hideous of those criminals was a man by the name of Hans Frank. He'd been reared as a Catholic, a lawyer, became active in the Nazi party became a major figure in the Nazi party. When uh, Germany conquered Poland, he was named the governor of the occupation. And he was a beast. He was absolutely a beast. The terrible, terrible things that he did. Well, he got to the scaffold. And he was standing there, and before the trap door was opened, he turned to the priest and said, My Jesus, mercy. See, we can all convert. And the Lord knows that, and the Lord is always there with us, no matter what we've done. Now, none of us are in the situation of the defendants at the Nuremberg trials, but none of us is perfect in any event, and all of us are humans like Peter, James, and John. And simply, if we wish to come to the Lord, and that's what Lent is all about, he is there to help us because he loves us.